In almost every single investment banking interview, you will get asked, walk me through a DCF or tell me about a DCF. Now, the good thing is most people do get this right, but they give an incomplete answer. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to fully answer this question and give an answer that will impress your interviewer. Hi, I'm Nasir. I started investment banking in 2013 and I've recruited and interviewed over a dozen candidates. In investment banking, there are two valuation approaches. There is intrinsic valuation, which is the DCF, and then there is relative valuation, which is comparables analysis and precedent transactions, which we've already gone through, where the value of the company which you're valuing is dependent on either what similar companies are being valued at or what similar companies has already been valued at. Now, you can think of it as the value of your house is dependent on the value of your neighbor's house. Now, whereas intrinsic valuation, the value of the company which you're valuing is dependent purely on its own ability to generate cash flow. So think of it as the value of your house is purely dependent on its ability to generate rent. And we're going to encapsulate the future rent in one figure, and that's the value which we're going to place on your house. So simply put, a DCF is discounting the future cash flow of a company, and that's how we value a company. And you can pretty much do a DCF in three steps. Step number one is projecting the free cash flows. And you can either project it out five years, 10 years. Ideally, you want to stay as short as possible because then you are far more accurate. And how you project this out is by getting EBIT. EBIT is earnings before interest and tax. Once you have EBIT, you will then tax adjust it because we live in a world where we have to pay taxes. So EBIT times one minus the tax rate. You will then take away CapEx because you have to pay in order to maintain the business. You will then add back depreciation and amortization because those are non-cash expenses. And then you will take away net changes to working capital. Once you have that, you will then project it out five years or 10 years into the future. And the rate at which you're going to grow this is going to be dependent on your growth, revenue growth assumptions. Step number two, we've already projected out five years of cash flows, but we are going to assume that our company is going to be operating longer than five years. And in fact, it's going to operate forever. So we have to encapsulate the cash flow of year six to infinity in one number. And there are two approaches to this, and this is known as a terminal value. There is the multiples approach, this is more widely used in investment banking. This is where we're going to use an exit multiple multiplied by the EBITDA of year five. So we get year five EBITDA or EBIT or revenue, and then we'll multiply it by an exit multiple. This exit multiple we're going to get from equity research reports. So other investment bankers that have already done this analysis for our company or a very similar company. And once we multiply this exit multiple with the EBITDA, that's going to be our terminal value. Now that's the first approach. The second approach is going to be the Gordon growth method. Now here we're going to assume that our company is going to be growing forever. And it's going to be growing at a very low single digit, either GDP rate or inflation rate of the company which it operates in. So we will get the free cash flow of year five and then we'll multiply it by one plus the growth rate. And we will divide that by the weighted average cost of capital minus the growth rate. And that's the Gordon growth method. As a quick side note, in reality, most investment bankers will just depend on the multiples method because one, it's quicker to calculate. And second, the Gordon growth method assumes that companies are going to be growing forever. Now, there hasn't been a single company in human history that has gone on for longer than a couple hundred years. So it's irrational to assume that a company is going to forever be growing. Now, we still calculate both methods, but we use the Gordon growth method as a sanity check as opposed to actually using it in our analysis. Step three, now that we've calculated the future cash flows of our company and the terminal value, we now need to discount those back into present terms. And we're going to use the weighted average cost of capital as our discounting rate. So once we've calculated our weighted average cost of capital, i.e. WAC, we're then going to use a simple formula of free cash flow over one plus the weighted average cost of capital to the power of the period you're in. 
So if you're in year one, it's the power of one, year two, power of two. And once we've calculated that, we will then do all of them and add them up and that's going to be the value of your DCF, i.e. the enterprise value of this company. And that's pretty much it. Now, remember in the beginning, I said most candidates give a correct answer, but they give an incomplete answer. And the reason is because they just stop here and they completely ignore two problems facing the DCF. You're assuming that you're in January and when you discount the future cash flows, you're going to be collecting it throughout the year. So for example, in year one, when we calculated our first year cash flow and discounting it, we're assuming we're currently in January and we have to the end of December to, to collect all of this money. But what if it's July the 1st? What if half of the year has already gone? Then can you still discount a full year's cash flow? Well, no, you can't. So in that case, you have to use a stub period. A stub period is going to adjust for the calendarization or the time period of this cash flow. So it's only going to be discounting half of this cash flow. So instead of using to the power of one, we're going to be using to the power of 0 0.5. And then we're going to adjust for subsequent years. Problem number two. We're also assuming that we're going to be collecting this cash flow at the end of the year. So we're going to be collecting this cash flow on December 31st of every single year. But we know that businesses generate cash throughout the year. So we have to use the mid-year discounting period. So we're going to be incrementing our discounting period by 0 0.5. And if we don't use the stub period and the mid-year discounting period, your DCF analysis is completely wrong because you're going to be inflating the value of the cash flows and i.e. you're going to be getting a higher number than what you should be getting or a lower number in some cases. So it's really important that you understand how this works. Now every single investment banker has to do this in practice in the real world. So when you're answering this question during your interviews and if you include the stub period and the mid-year discounting period, you are going to impress your interviewer because 90% of candidates do not include this in their answer. Now, how do you combine a stub period and a mid-year discounting period? Now, that's far more easily explained by doing a live demonstration on an Excel model. And if you would like to see a real live DCF model, as well as other valuation methodologies in Excel, then consider looking at our financial modeling course where we'll show you step by step what investment banking analysts and associates do when they do these financial modeling processes and more importantly how do they interpret the results. After you get asked what is a DCF or walk me through a DCF, there are 20 to 30 very common follow-up questions which analysts and associates will typically get and if you're an intern from a finance background you can also get them. Some of these follow-up questions would be in a DCF, do you use unlevered free cash flow or levered free cash flow and why? What proportion of the DCF is attributable to the terminal value? Typically in a DCF, are you trying to find the enterprise value or the equity value? Why do we use the weighted average cost of capital and what is the formula behind it? How do you unlever beta and relever beta? Now there are around 20 to 30 of these very common DCF follow-up questions. And if you'd like to know more, then have a look at our investment banking interview guide for a full list of all of the questions you can get asked as well as the ideal answers. And also be sure to check out our other videos where we go through other investment banking interview questions and break down how to answer it. Okay, so if this video has helped you better understand how to walk through a DCF, then be sure to like it and share it. And as well as leave us a comment if there are any other questions which you have. I always check and read the comment section so I'll be sure to reply to you. If I don't reply to you in the comment section, then I'll probably answer it in the next video. So be sure to check that out. And as usual, subscribe and press the bell button to get notified for our future videos.